Please, you know, I'm delighted to belong to a Franciscan parish, St. Camillus in Silver Spring, Maryland. And I have a couple slides, and so I will see if I can find them and share my screen. Yep. And we can sort of uh, get on our way. So the topic of my little talk here is making a difference for creation through lobbying. We're sort of on the cusp of ecumenical advocacy days, which certainly has a lobbying focused at the national level. Um, and there's obviously a, a lot you can do um, lobbying at your local level as well. And I will sort of try to um, talk a little bit about what we've been able to do um, recently in Maryland. You know, I think the first uh, point that I really want everybody to come away from is that you're important, right? You can make a difference, right? Electeds, elected representatives, you know, they're, they're interested in doing good work, but you know, they're mostly interested in getting elected. And as constituents, you are very important people to them because you are influencers um, over whether or not they get reelected or not. Um, and and um, most good elected representatives know that in their districts or in their states or in um, whatever their jurisdiction is, um, they've got smart people who can help them do their job better. And so it's worth um, making the commitment to using both uh, what you know, the information you can provide, and what you believe, i.e. your values, to interact with and influence your representatives. Now, most people who um, think about lobbying think that, well, okay, the whole point of lobbying is to go in, uh, meet with somebody, uh, give them your story, uh, make your points, and convince them, and then they're going to go do something that you want them to do. And uh, what I would say is that's true to an extent, but lobbying really is about something else, right? It's really about relationships. <clears throat> and you really have to sort of think of your goals in lobbying as not to get somebody to agree with you, although that's nice, but it's to get them to see you as somebody they trust, as a trusted source of information. Uh, because if you develop a relationship of trust with them and they know that they can rely on you to give them kind of a straight story, to give them information that they need that they may not otherwise be getting, um, that makes you much more valuable to them and that makes you much more effective at persuading them of the merit of whatever it is uh, that you think. Now, um, the lobbying process obviously uh, has to follow the legislative process. And so with... Um, Apologies to School Have Rock and, and, and I'm a Bill. Um, um, I'm, I'm going to sort of walk you th quickly through uh, what happens when a bill um, gets introduced and along the way to becoming a law. Many of you know this already, but so I'll try to be brief. Bob, I'm um, sorry to interrupt. Each of these points. Yes. I, we're getting a little bit of interference from your microphone. If you can just move it away from your shirt. There, perfect. Oh, is that better? Much better. Oh, Thank sorry. you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Oh dear. Okay. So anyway, um, thanks. Thanks for speaking up. Um, so each of these points along this uh, the timeline for a bill's consideration offers an opportunity for you to make an ask uh, of of somebody in a lobbying situation. So the first thing that happens in a bill, of course, it's introduced by a member. And uh, usually um, a, a member likes to have co-sponsors uh, to show that just from the get-go that there is support for the idea. So one of the things that you can ask if you're pursuing um, a particular bill and talking to an elected representative um, is you can ask them to become a co-sponsor. And that's a very concrete ask to have um, in in um, in the Congress, of the United States. Uh, people can add as co-sponsors at any time. Um, so that's certainly um, the the beginning of the process. All bills go to com are referred to committees. Some of them just die right at that point. The committee never has a hearing on them. You know, the bill is just kind of you know has been introduced, but that's that's pretty much it. But um, Committee, the committee hearing process is really sort of the first big winnowing process um, to create a record, just to, set, to, to justify whether the, the bill is worth moving forward and if it ought to be sort of modified in some way, shape, or form along the way. You can encourage your elected representatives, to, if they are on a committee to which the bill has been referred, um, you can encourage them to attend the hearing. Uh, you can arm them with uh, information ahead of the hearing about the bill. Um, if there's questions you think that they should ask um, witnesses, uh, those are things that you can provide to your elected representatives. Um, 
uh, when a committee has had a hearing and has developed a record on a bill, if it decides it wants the bill to move forward, which sometimes they decide a hearing's enough and they don't want to take it any further, but if they want to move the bill forward, then they will have what's called a markup. They will have a business meeting of the committee in which they will consider the bill formally, consider possible amendments to it, and then have a vote on whether the bill should advance out of committee to consideration by the full chamber. Once bills are uh, are advanced out of committees, they could still die. The, you know, the, the chamber time is is necessarily limited, and so a lot of bills get reported from committee, then are picked up by the full chamber uh, as sort of a function of what the leadership decision is about what the priorities are that year. But if the full chamber considers it again, it's open for amendment. And finally, if the full chamber, whether it's the House of Representatives or the Senate, agrees and pass it, then they have to sort of send it to the other chamber for action. Bills have to pass in exactly the same form. They have to have exactly the same words passed by both chambers in order to go to the president. So if a bill um, is introduced in the House of Representatives and then goes over to the Senate and the Senate decides it wants to amend it, it has to go back to the House to see if they like those amendments or not, and they've got to work it out. And in the end, both chambers have to kind of uh, approve the bill in identical form for it to go to the president for his signature. Mm. Now, how do you find out um, you know, where your bill is? Okay, And at the bottom of the screen is a wonderful um, web address, www.congress.gov. This is the main um, portal for the legislative information system of the U.S. Congress. And it will tell you, you know, um, what the bill number is, who the sponsors are, might have a short summary of it, tell you who the co-sponsors are, what committee has been referred to, and sort of it'll sort of help you understand what stage of this legislative process it's at. So this is kind of a canvas on which we're kind of painting sort of the, the whole process of lobbying. Now, um, um, you know, if you seek to talk to your elected representative, um, you may be directed to talk to one of his staff or her staff, right? And sometimes people think that that's a problem, that they're being disrespected somehow. Why am I talking to a staffer? Actually, um, staffers are pretty important people. And so being directed to talk to a staffer is actually not a problem. Uh, they are the people who winnow information and are conduits of information and analysis to their bosses. And they also know that they need to care about their boss's constituents. I worked for a senator from New Mexico. And people from Mexico came into town and they wanted to meet with me. I can tell you, I met with them. And, you know, I heard their perspectives on bills we were considering in the committee. Um, and I cared. I treated them well. Um, I, I cared about what they thought because... You know, they were from the same state as my boss, right? And so they had ways, and I certainly didn't want them going back to New Mexico, saying what a rat fink my boss, Senator Bingman, was and his staff, right? So staffers, you know, care about uh, what constituents think, and they are kind of important allies, um, potentially, for you um, if you are making a visit to Washington. Um, and in the context of ecumenical advocacy days, uh, if a meeting is set up for you and suddenly you find yourself talking to a staffer, don't be alarmed. That happens all the time. Uh, members' um, calendars are very uh, chock-a-block full of you know, all sorts of conflicts and things that come up at the last minute. So staffers are, are good people to get, um, convince that you are a trusted source of information. Now, you're not just limited to talking to people in Washington because um, all electeds, you know, um, go back to their districts or go back to their home states on a fairly regular basis. Congress sort of you know, takes a break every six to eight weeks, um, and they used to call them recesses, and then they decided to rebaptize them as district work periods. But, you know, they're <laughs> going back. And if you're in the process of, um, if you want to sort of contact your congressperson or your senator, if you want to have some face time with them, and particularly if you're taking a group of people with you, uh, contacting their local office. You know, um, all 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 congress all congress people have. Um, district offices. Uh, a senator will have a couple regional offices around the state. Uh, you can sort of contact them and say, look, we'd like to have a meeting with the senator or with the representative the next time he or she um, is in town. Um, and that's an opportunity for you to interact with them um, and to um, talk to them about um, an issue and why it's important. Now, when you actually sit down to talk to somebody, um, you know, whether it's in the state or whether it's in, in Washington, D.C., about um, a bill and you're actually in the process of lobbying, uh, there's a few things that are important for you to know about. And I would call them the ABCs of a lobbying conversation. 
A, B, C. Be accurate, be brief, and be courteous. So let's talk about accurate. It's really helpful if you're going to talk about a bill, if you can refer to it by the correct name and the correct bill number. That will sort of help the staffers immediately understand what it is that you are concerned about, interested about, want to talk to them about. It's important to do you know, your homework on the issue. Again, this uh, www.congress.gov website um, you know, may tell you um, if your representative or senator has already been a co-sponsor of it or if they've taken some sort of position on it. Um, and if you're in a lobbying conversation and you get asked a question that you do not know the answer to, it is perfectly fine. It is preferable to say, geez, I don't know. Let me look at let me let me look into that and get back to you. That's important for two things. One, if you are a staffer for a senator or a representative, a lot of people have lobbied you. You have a really good BS detector, so you know you know when people are making stuff up, right? And you're not impressed. So so you get points for honesty right at the outset. If you get asked a question you don't know the answer to, if you say, I, you know, I don't know the answer to that, I can find it out and I'll get back to you. And the and I'll get back to you part is kind of really helpful because it really gives you an opportunity to have another conversation with that person. Be brief. Uh, get to the point. If there is a group of you who are going to be in a meeting, make sure everybody's got their speaking roles and their main points sorted out ahead of time. So people aren't falling all over each other in the meeting and people aren't saying the same things or contradicting each other in a meeting. That never ends well. And then uh, be concise. You know, um, no matter who you're talking to, a staffer or a member, they've got limited time and they appreciate people sort of getting to the point and explaining what it is that they want um, or have a concern about and what the specific ask is. So think about when you go into a conversation, what is the yes or no question that I want to kind of get to in all of this? Will, will you co-sponsor the bill, right? Yes or no, okay? If you learn from www.congress.gov that your representative is on a committee that's reviewing the bill, will you help this bill get a hearing? Will you support it in committee? Those are kind of very kind of concrete asks that, you know, uh, you may not get, they may say, oh, we'll have to think about it or review it or blah, 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 but they, they know you care and what it is you care about. And so being brief is important. And finally, be courteous, you know, uh, don't be upset if you suddenly are meeting with a different person than you thought. That's not personally directed at you. Uh, don't yell, don't be snarky, don't threaten. Thank everybody at the beginning. Thank everybody at the end. You really kind of the, the 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 lasting impression that you make may be the last thing you say in the meeting. Okay, so at the end of the meeting, be sure you're thankful uh, and grateful, and be sure that you have kind of a positive note to end on that they will take with them away from that meeting. Be nice to everybody. Find out that, and especially be nice to the receptionists. They have a terrible job. You know, everybody who's angry calls up, and they, they're the person who, who sort of is the first person that gets vented at. So. Find out their names, right? Uh, find out a little something about them. You'll have a minute or two in the waiting area. So just see if you could, if they're not you know, immensely busy, strike up a little conversation with them. They'll appreciate it. Uh, the other office staff, they appreciate when people are nice to the receptionists as well. Um, and next time when you call, uh, the receptionist might remember you and kind of put you through. So uh, that's, that's those, those are, they're important people and they should be treated with uh, respect. And dignity. And then after it's done, send a thank you note, followed up with an again, a very concise summary of what the main points that you wanted them to take away from the meeting. And again, be courteous to them and all of that. Um, after the meeting, look for ways to stay in touch with your representative or his staff about the issue. You know, you can help them learn more about the issue and its and its effects in your community because you live in your community, right? And so that's certainly um, you know something that you can do in terms of staying in touch with them. And you know, if they um, if they do something that you like, right? Um, uh, you know, think of the ways that you can highlight their good works uh, in the community because you know again they're always getting they're always worried about getting bad press. But think of ways that you can work with them to sort of highlight uh, good things that they have done in the community. Uh, make up an award and give it to them, right? You know, from your from your group. Uh, people always like getting awards. Uh, they can make, maybe they can do a press release about it. Okay, so you know, um, 
you know, think about creative ways in which you can sort of help them achieve their goals of getting good visibility for the work that they do and which also helps them get reelected. And again, just to kind of come around in full circle. Okay, it's about relationships. Okay, so so you really want to be careful to um, establish good relationships and to cultivate those relationships, um, and to sort of see things through that prism as you sort of lobby people. Now, I'm going to say just a couple of things about um, what we've we've um, just done in Maryland. Uh, we we had a 90 say we have a 90 day legislative session at the beginning of every year. So, a, on a midnight on April 12th was the was the you know drop dead moment uh, for our our um, legislation, and um, um, for the last uh, three or four years. Catholics across the state of Maryland have been sort of organizing themselves to, um, um, you know, support support climate and environmental legislation in our state legislature, which is called the Maryland General Assembly. And so um, each year, at sort of the end of the year, as we sort of go into the beginning of the next year, we research the key bills that, in our view, will combine this element of uh, hearing the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor. Uh, we work with other uh, similarly minded groups, Interfaith Power and Light. We have a group called the Interfaith Partnership for the Chesapeake, uh, the Maryland League of Conservation Voters. So, you know, we sort of listen carefully to sort of what their top priorities are and look for this kind of double, double um, benefit of being good for the climate, but also being good for uh, social justice. And we also talk to our bishops and their staffs about using their official lobbying arm to support these bills. Um, but really, we focus really mostly on doing our own sort of grassroots things. We Bishops are, are sort of hard people to control. Um, uh, at least, I, at least I found that way. Um, in this current um, session that just ended, we picked five bills. One was a major um, comprehensive climate bill for the state of Maryland. One, the Transit Safety Investment Act was really trying to upgrade and sort of restore the functionality of public transit in Maryland. Uh, zero emission bus transaction, the Transition Act, that was to sort of require that any buses that the state buys or state agency buys be zero emissions. Coal community transition was about getting coal out of our generation mix. And then there was a proposal to uh, put a, a, a constitutional amendment in the Maryland state constitution, giving people sort of uh, environmental rights. Um, and our mobilization approach, you know, in a COVID um, a time when we can't sort of set up after mass at a table to sign people up, um, is we sort of went electronic and, and virtual this year. We, this is a, on the right hand side is a facsimile of sort of the, our Google document where we collected expressions of support with names and email addresses. You know, we asked people for their parishes of residential zip codes. And we used the last two pieces of information to sort of figure out what legislative district they were living in. And so all told, we got 228 Catholics across the state of Maryland from like 40 different parishes uh, and 33 different legislative districts to sign our expression of support for these five bills. And then we worked with partner organizations like the League of Conservation Voters and, um, and uh, Interfaith Power and Light and Interfaith Partners for the Chesapeake to identify specific legislators who needed outreach in support of these bills. Since we knew who lived in their district, we were able to sort of encourage people to call in. We submitted testimony for hearings. We wrote letters to leadership. And so we were sort of part of the, the general mix to um, um, push these bills forward. And we had some successes, right? Two of the bills that we uh, <coughs> were lobbying for, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> passed and are on their way to the governor. One of them, the big climate bill, sadly only passed one chamber, installed in the other. We'll have to come back to that next year. <clears throat> the coal bill uh, was withdrawn by the sponsors because they, it looked like it was going to go down in flames, and so they, they withdrew it as opposed to getting a, people locked into a bad vote. And then the constitutional amendment. Constitutional amendments go on our ballot in even-numbered years, and so... <clears throat> This was kind of like an educational year, maybe, for, for the proposal. It really is going to see most of its action next year. So that's kind of a, a sort of a very, you know, you know, short thumbnail sketch of, you know, lobbying as I've seen it as sort of as, as I said, as a prime, past prime target and as a sort of a, you know, someone who is a current practitioner of it and also a sense of, you know, things that you can do at the state level, at least um, as Catholics in conjunction with other Catholics to um, 
organized and to sort of, you know, bring people's voices together and to channel them into the process. And so with that, let me see if people have questions and appreciate you taking the time to listen to my little presentation. Thank you so much, Bob. That was wonderful. And, and yeah, this, we wanted to, when we were talking before, we said we want to leave a lot of time to have this open conversation 